Good morning, Grace. Good morning. It's good to see everyone. Yes, thank you. It's good to see everyone. Uh, happy to be here. If you are new or relatively new to Grace, we want to extend a special welcome to you. We're glad that you're here. Uh, we're going to take a moment to go through some announcements, uh, some things happening in the church and things like that. Uh, but the best way to get to know all that's going to happen and all of the details, because I'm only going to share a few, uh, will be if you're on our email list. And if you're interested in that, uh, you should have received a bulletin on your way in. If you tear off that insert and uh, give us your email and information there, put that in the offering box on your way out. We'll make sure that you get that email with all of the pertinent information. But what we want to share with you today is that on Tuesday, uh, the ladies' Bible study has started up again for the fall, and so uh, that's been going strong. So they're meeting uh, this Tuesday, 6.30 here at the church. Uh, it's been a great uh, fellowship so far from what I understand, and so uh, you, would, you would love that, that study as they walk through the Bible together. 
I uh, also want to point out that not this next Wednesday, but the Wednesday after, we'll, on November 17th, will be SWAP, and that's our uh, effort to uh, serve some of the, the younger students in our church. And so if you're a junior high or high school, that's meant for you, but it is for families. And so it's, it's for you to be able to use as uh, you see fit and helpful. So that some parents wonder, like, well, can I come and benefit from that as well? Yes, you can, certainly. Do I have to sit with my child? No, no. Yeah, and... <laughs> Uh, but you can, as you will, if you need to, and that sort of thing as well. So uh, know that that is available to you. What we're really excited to talk about that's happening this week is uh, kind of the culmination of, uh, for our purposes, Operation Christmas Child. We've been talking about this for a while now, and uh, so this is your last Sunday to be able to pick up a box, fill it, and then bring it back next Sunday because that's uh, uh, collection week is next starts next week. So that's one option. But we highly encourage you and yours to come to the packing party. That'll be this Thursday from six, at 6 p.m. Uh, there'll be pizza and cookies, and uh, so it's, it's a great time. It's a, it's a wonderful opportunity. And then there'll be a tables set up with the toys that will go around and pack other boxes. So people who have brought supplies, right? Maybe you didn't pack a box, but you got I said I got a great deal on all these toothbrushes and things like that that we'll be putting in these, in these gifts. Uh, I mean, think about the opportunity to be able to give uh, not only some, some wonderful toys, uh, some, some health products, things like that, things that are valuable that, that would be uh, wonderful for, for a child who's never gotten a present before in their life, but they also get the gospel as well. So uh, what, this is our, our ability to be a part of that, so we hope that you come on Thursday. And then a special congratulations to Landis's. They had uh, their son Calvin. And so, uh, and I don't know if that's after the reformer or after the comic book character from the Sunday comics, Calvin and Hobbes, but, and maybe both, and that's, that's good. Um, but if, uh, please be a blessing to them when you see them. Also, there's a table in the back so you can bless them with uh, uh, gifts or gift cards or something like that, uh, and that, that'll be on that back table. So uh, we're grateful that you are here today with us. Rod is going to continue our service in prayer. Good morning. Grand to be out on such a beautiful Sunday, and I hope that you guys enjoyed the glorious day that we had yesterday. Looking forward to another good day, and uh, glad to see the deer hunters here who have gotten their deer. So <laughs> that's excellent. You'll have your venison ready to go. You know, when we think in Scripture, uh, maybe somebody think of as a as a great man who, uh, you know was just uh, so into ministry and could handle any situation, I think a lot of people would think of the Apostle Paul. But, you know, the Apostle Paul did not uh, say that he was a strong man. He, he said that he had his many weaknesses, too. And because of that, he desired that people uplift him in prayer from one church to another. In fact, in... Um, Philippians 1.19, it says, I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this, this means the persecution that he received, will turn out for my deliverance. And there are several other things that, that uh, we find in New Testament passages that Paul asked for. He uh, requested prayer for the right words in sharing the gospel. And can we not relate to that? That's in Ephesians and to proclaim the gospel without fear, also from Ephesians, to have clear communication from the book of Colossians, that doors be opened to the gospel from Colossians, and that God's word would speed ahead and be honored, and that's from Second Thessalonians. You know, Paul, he went through a lot. He was in shipwrecks, he was in beatings, he was arrested, persecuted, uh, persecuted by unbelieving Jews, unbelieving Gentiles, about uh, bad teachers in, in the churches that wanted to bring him down. And he, he understood that the, the matter for prayer was so important to him. And uh, this is why it, that uh, in Romans 15, 13, 31, it says, Paul asked several times to be rescued from unbelievers and from evil men. And then also, um, 
He asks that prayers be given to him to rescue him from deadly peril as he traveled, and travel was not necessarily a safe thing in those days. So he desired prayer from the saints. And as we look at the world today, especially as we think of this uh, time that we set aside to consider uh, remembering the persecuted church the worldwide, where in many countries, especially in many Muslim countries, and you know the song we sang in the beginning, you know maybe believers gathered underground in places like North Korea and other such countries where you know to be a Christian is a tantamount to a death sentence. You know, ought we not then come before the Lord with regularity to remember that there are those who cannot, as we come together freely today, you know, and sometimes it helps to be reminded. So, you know, if you go online and do some research on the persecuted church, uh, maybe that helps to remind us, you know, and to give stories uh, of their that you can uh, relate to the people who are involved in that. And they ask for prayer. Not always that they be instantly delivered because it's if the Lord's will that they suffer long, but they, they want to be able to be true to the Lord, to honor him, and they ask for Christians outside of those situations to remember them before the throne of grace. So I think it's a good thing to remember. So let's come before the throne of grace together this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can gather freely here. And admittedly, we take this so much for granted, way too much for granted. When there are people, uh, your children throughout the world who are persecuted because of the fact that they stand for you. Lord, we would ask that you uh, today just encourage them. Would you preserve them? And even, Lord, for those who are persecuting your children uh, as they see the reaction of your children, Father, that they might, many of them, come to put their faith and trust in Christ and know the joy of knowing him. We thank you, Father, for your goodness. Thank you for each one who is here this morning. Will you meet each need? We give you the praise and we ask your blessing upon the balance of the service in Jesus' name. Please stand and continue with us in worship. Yeah. 
shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all today uh, in your name. Amen. What's the music stand mean? Only if you join me. Um, if you're not familiar, uh, uh, the music stand means it's time for the annual biography uh, on or around Reformation Sunday. I, I do this every year, and I missed last week. Last week, we were in Milwaukee visiting Kelden and Spencer's church, got to uh, attend their church for the very first time, get to meet their pastors, and, and thank everybody I talked to. Thank you. For welcoming our daughter and our son-in-law, thank you for being a wonderful church where where they could land. You know, when you when you you send your kids off uh, and they find a great church, uh, it is blessing beyond what you can imagine. So that was great. But uh, it was Reformation Sunday last week, and I like how the pastor spoke about it. He said it's an opportunity for us to be reminded that our faith is not in a vacuum, that we're not just you know, floating about uh, without a history. Uh, it's, it, our faith has a long history, right? It goes all the way, of course, it goes back to Genesis, but it goes back to the disciples and, and Pentecost. And then the period of the gospel was, was lost somewhat for centuries, rediscovered, re, uh, uh, reinvigorated during uh, the Reformation 1,500 years later. And this now is the 16th uh, biography that I've done, historical figure that I've covered. And before I start, I want us to understand that, that all these men, all these women are sinners. All of them are imperfect in so many ways, but all of them have, as Jude says, contended for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. All of these men and women, as Hebrews 8 says, were people of whom the world was not worthy. The fact is that you and I stand upon their shoulders uh, to this day. They, they are part of that great cloud of witnesses. It started in Hebrews chapter 11. It has continued uh, throughout the centuries. And let me uh, make mention of one announcement related to 
Rod was talking about today is International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church, and covered Richard Wormbrand a few years ago. This uh, coming Monday and Wednesday in La Crosse at Marcus Cinema is the movie Sabina, and it's the movie about Richard's wife's story. Uh, you might know his story, but we really don't know much about her, so uh, it's just Monday and Wednesday at, at 7 o'clock, I think it is, Marcus Cinema. So we have our tickets, and it's been an email, so it might be something you, you want to check out. But for example, I didn't realize she was also in prison, much shorter than Richard was, but she was also in prison. But this morning we are looking at the life of Susanna Spurgeon, certainly the lesser known of the, the two Spurgeons. And you, from that last list, you'll see over the, uh, this is the fourth woman that I have covered out of, out of the 16. And uh, she is the first one that is known mostly for being a wife and a mother. Uh, the others were missionaries, uh, etc. Now, Elizabeth Elliot was also a wife and a mother, but, but Susanna Spurgeon, ex- really exclusively, her role was as a wife and a mother. But you'll see how she lived out that calling in an absolute wonderful way. Uh, Also, because it's Susanna Spurgeon and her husband is Charles Spurgeon, those two are inseparable. So, so they're they're mostly focusing on Susie, but but their story will be told uh, collectively uh, throughout. Now, I've taken most of my information from this biography, and I always like to remind you: anybody can can find a good biography and read it. And I'm always always. Uh, so encouraged when I, when I read them and find other information uh, about them and put it into a talk. So you can do the same. Uh, and from this biography is a great introduction to her life. Susie's marriage to Charles was truly a lifelong romance. Charles could not have met the demands of his ministry, have written so prolifically, and have left such an indelible mark on history without the encouragement of Susie. By the way, she always went by the name Susie, so that's just what I'm going to call her. Sort of feels weird, but that's, that's what she'd want to be called. She read to him when he was depressed, prayed diligently for him when he was away from home, and he was depressed a lot, and he was away from home a lot. Wept with him in his trials and cared for him in his sicknesses. She even had a term of endearment for him, Tershatha, meaning your reverence. You know, like, oh, your reverence, you know, sort of playfully. Even her husband regularly admitted how much he depended upon his wife. Uh, he, he wrote, Susie is a blessed creature and does not attempt to keep me from the Lord's work, but on the contrary, she is willing to deny herself for the Lord's sake. How sweetly she cheers me when I, have not pre- when I think I have not preached well, and she bids me go on and whispers, What? You unbelieving? At such exampled success, what? You doubt? So, so here we have uh, the prince of preachers, and sometimes he says, Man, that was just uh, not a good sermon. And she comes alongside and encourages him. They celebrated their 36th wedding anniversary less than a month before Charles died. And from the biography, everything you read about them, and I can't go into great length on this, but it was truly one long romance. They're they're 36 years together. But their relationship was definitely not love at first sight. I don't don't know if you've ever had, if you had love at first sight. Um, I think it's largely not a thing. Theirs certainly was not. Uh, here's a description. When she first saw Charles in the pulpit, she was distracted more by his looks than she was drawn to his sermon. She was amused by his huge black satin stock and his long, badly trimmed hair and the blue pocket handkerchief with white spots. Susie was not at all fascinated by the young orator's eloquence and thought Spurgeon's countrified manner and speech excited more regret than reverence. So, not a good first look at all. He would not have been encouraged by that. But it was not long before she began to see him in a very different light. And they began spending some time together. And a few months later, Charles gave Susie a book and opened the book and pointed to this very passage. Let's see how uh, not subtle he was. Uh, Here's the passage. Seek a good wife of thy God, for she is the best gift of his providence. Yet ask not in bold confidence that which he hath not promised. If thou art to have a wife of thy youth, she is now living on the earth. Therefore think of her and pray for her, yea, though thou hast not seen her. Which by itself is a good encouragement to be, to be praying for your future husband or wife. And parents, 
to be praying for your children. I know my wife was much more faithful in that than I was. So he was not subtle, and what he did next was even less subtle. Susie looked at Charles as he whispered in her ear and said this, do you pray for him who is to be your husband? Right? Um, They went for a walk together by a lake, and in her diary, Susie wrote this, during that walk on that memorable day in June, I believe God himself united us to each other forever. From that time, our friendship grew apace and quickly ripened into deepest love. Well, they got married uh, not too long after that. More than 2,000 people had to be, not in attendance, 2,000 people had to be turned away. There was just throngs of people in the streets. And, and when she ar- arrived in the carriage along with her father, uh, they had to get uh, a lot of policemen and, and, and create a path for them just so they could get from the carriage to the church. Such was uh, the number of people that wanted to be a part of that. When they were married, Charles was only... 22 years old, already wildly popular. And it's really hard for us to imagine today how popular he was. Yes, we have uh, things that we call celebrity pastors. And uh, some of them are really, really solid. Some of them less so. But uh, part of what I experienced over the years going to conferences, and I don't go to as many as I used to, but any conference you go to, you can find the fanboys. You know, they're the ones that are, that are fawning after the celebrities and they, they want to get close and maybe get uh, an autographed book. And I just sort of grew tired of that myself. But it was sort of like that, except Charles Spurgeon was at the very top and there was no second. I mean, he pretty much uh, stood alone. Uh, he was an evangelical superstar. Now understand, he was not seeking this out, okay? It's just the way it became to be. And he referred to Susie as the ideal wife, and she was designed by God to be the greatest of all earthly blessings to him. Husbands, I encourage you, uh, make sure your wife knows that she is the greatest of all earthly blessings to you, okay? Maybe, set, you don't have to use those words, but make sure uh, that she knows that. Unlike other biographies, again, it's, it's, it's just not possible just to take Susie by herself, but uh, to do justice, uh, we need to combine her with her husband, uh, so that will be, uh, again, peppered throughout. But when Susie first heard Charles preach, he was only 19 years old. She was 21 years old, so, so yes, he married uh, an older woman, uh, but amazingly, he had been preaching since he was 16, and uh, as he got to be known, he, he got a, a much larger church, and, and of course, we're common today, mega churches, right? They're, they're all over the place, but uh, in their day, not very common at all. In fact, many would say that their first church, this uh, Metropolitan Tabernacle, and that's about, I think, about the third rendition of it from fires and, and, and so forth, um, may have been the fir- world's first mega church. It would officially seat 5,000, but they would cram 6,000, and again, people would line up outside uh, to be able to get a chance to hear him preach. One time, he asked the members of his church, knowing that there's so many people that wanted to hear him preach and couldn't, uh, why don't you all stay home next week and let everybody else uh, come and find a seat? I don't know how many regular people stayed home, but the next week it was absolutely full again. By the time he was 21 years old, he had preached over a 1,000 sermons, which, for better or for worse, is a little bit more than I've preached my entire life. Uh, So absolutely, absolutely prolific. It was said uh, that he was just absolutely brilliant. He would know the names of all 6,000 people in his church, which just seems unbelievable uh, to me. But in the midst of his ministry, getting caught up in it on on a Sunday morning, when he and Susie were engaged, there was more than one occasion where he would uh, get down and come off the pulpit and introduce himself to her like he'd never met her. He was so so focused. So you can imagine that maybe didn't go over uh, so well in in the moment. But um, she said this, Susie reasoned that my chosen husband was no ordinary man, that his whole life was absolutely dedicated to God and his service, and that I must never, never hinder him by trying to put myself first in his heart. She lived to support him in every possible way, but she would also become quite famous herself, even after he was gone. So with that sort of as a a backdrop, I want to give you six main principles to take from her life, number one, endurance through suffering and loneliness. And one of the first things that you'll understand about Susie Spurgeon is how much she suffered in her lifetime. 
Now, she was very healthy growing up in her 20s, uh, very, very active, you know, uh, very common to walk great distances. When you live in a large city like that, she would walk four or five miles one way, four or five miles back. She and her husband would hike together in the Alps. But then in her early 30s, she began to suffer with debilitating pain. No official records were, were kept, no specific diagnosis, although her ailment caused severe pain, kept her confined at home almost all the time. Now, the author didn't say a lot in that biography about her specific diagnosis or illness, but I found something he wrote outside of the biography, and here's what he said. One of my theories is that she had endometriosis because she suffered the rest of her life, and there were seasons in which her suffering was so intense that she felt the pain throughout the bo- her body, which endometriosis can cause. It's not just pain to female organs. It's also pain in your head, in your hands, and everywhere else. She describes days where she was unable to lift her head or hand. I mean, that's a possibility. Could have been a hysterectomy that went bad because she, she later had a surgery that didn't go well. And he says, of course, 1860s medical care was, was very different from today. Uh, Spurgeon had a 12,000 volume library, just stunning amount of books. But in that massive library was a book titled a practical treatise of inflammation of the uterus, its cervix, and appendages, and its connection with other uterine diseases. I, I would agree with the, the biographer here that that kind of book does not belong on Charles Spurgeon's uh, shelf unless it directly affected his wife. His pain, her pain rather, was so severe she rarely attended church. Let that sink in for a moment. You've got the prince of preachers, people just traveling great distances to hear him preach, and she rarely ever gets to hear him. Again, I mentioned Susie's uh, had a sort of a botched surgery, uh, but her surgeon was famous. It was, happens to be Queen Victoria's favorite doctor. The same doctor is credited with, with discovering chloroform as an anesthesia. Uh, he himself had converted to Christ shortly before uh, he met the Spurgeons. And when Charles asked him, well, how much was the surgery? How much do I owe you, doc? He says, well, I suppose it should be a thousand guineas, and when you are Archbishop of Canterbury, I shall expect you to pay it. Till then, let us consider it settled by love, which is, you know, that's the sort of relationships that they uh, developed over the years. Uh, uh, They love people, and people love them. Her son Charles wrote, sick saints are fair lilies surrounded by the thickets of their wants that they may be for Christ alone. Such a lily was my dear mother shut up in the prison house of pain so that she might shed a fragrant influence through her book fund, which we'll talk about shortly, and thereby perfume the hearts and homes of many and make the church of God redolent with the aroma of a consecrated life. First of all, the way they write is just beautiful, is it not? Uh, But what he is saying is that her suffering became a perfume to others, that her sorrow and pain uh, was a benefit to those around her. And that's more what we'll learn about her life. And when you learn, and and, uh, as you learned this morning about all the things she accomplished in her life, keep in mind this sort of pain, lifelong pain, everything she did, every day, almost every moment of every day of her life, was she was racked in pain, but she did all those things through that pain. And through all that, she also had to deal with her husband's health problems and ongoing depression. Charles struggled with gout and kidney disease. He was uh, overweight. A Spurgeon scholar noted this. One psychiatrist has noted that if he lived today, Spurgeon would be diagnosed with bipolar disorder and treated with medicine. There are times where she would just find him weeping over in a corner somewhere, just overcome. He himself had no idea why his depression could be so dark. You can hear how much he he needed his dear wife at his side during such times. He said this, My love, were you here, how you would comfort me, but since you are not, I shall do what is better still. Go upstairs alone and pour out my griefs into my Savior's ear. And he also says, I shall feel deeply indebted to you if you will pray very earnestly for me. I fear I am not so full of love to God as I used to be. I lament my sad decline in spiritual things. You and others may not have observed it, but I am now conscious of it 
and a sense thereof has put bitterness in my cup of joy. So it's good to, to be reminded, right? As I said, these, these people are, are sinners. And not only did he have uh, depression, but, but it affected him spiritually here. He says, I, I don't have the, the level of joy that, that I ought. And he's just, he's confiding in her. And by extension, he's confiding in us, isn't he? In reminding us, yes, yes, we all, all struggle at times. A source of his depression centered on a tragedy that happened just uh, about their first, end of their first year of marriage. Their new church, the Metropolitan Tabernacle, opened in 1861, overflowed with, again, 6,000 people, but it wasn't enough. Too, too many people wanted uh, to hear him, so they decided to move into the Surrey Music Hall, which held 12,000. There were still 10,000, uh, even then, waiting in the streets. Early in the service, someone entered the building and yelled, fire, the galleries are giving way, and the place is falling. There was no fire, there was no structural damage, but the emotional damage had been done to the, to the listeners of that. Panic ensued, resulting in seven people being trampled to death and 28 others in serious condition. And we just had, uh, may have seen on the news, some concert, I think eight were, were killed in a large concert over the weekend, uh, but this was a worship service. Seven people trampled to death in a worship service. Charles was beside himself with grief and misery. It, it threatened to completely ruin his ministry. Uh, rumor actually spread that he had died. He responded, I, I was not dead, thank God, but the bystanders might well have imagined that the terrible shock had killed me, though he did, in fact, obviously did not die in that evening. The effects of it plagued him for the rest of his life. Life. Susie referred to that event as the black shadow of sorrow which the Lord saw fit to cast over our young and happy lives. Charles said of himself that perhaps no soul went so near the burning fire furnace of insanity yet came away unharmed. And while this is happening, I mentioned uh, they were only married a year. They've got one-month-old twin boys. So here's Susie caring for these brand-new twins and caring for for her husband through all this grief and, and the criticism and anger that was directed at them. Charles often wrote about his dark days. I have endured tribulation from many flails. Sharp bodily pain succeeded mental depression, and this was accompanied by both bereavement and affliction in the person of, person of one dear as life. The waters rolled in continually wave upon wave, I do not mention this to exact sympathy, but to simply let the reader see that I am no dry land sailor. I have traversed those oceans many a time. I know the roll of the billows and the rush of the winds. Never were the promises of Jehovah so precious to me as at this hour. Some of them I never understood till now. I had not reached the date at which they matured, for I was not myself mature enough to perceive their meaning." How much more wonderful is the Bible to me now than it was a few months ago? Did you see what he's saying there? Without that suffering, he was not understanding certain parts of Scripture. But it was in the suffering that they just jumped off the page and went straight into his heart. Have you experienced that? I hope you have. When he was in his late 30s, uh, Charles, because of his own illnesses and, and uh, partly due to the, the cold uh, London winters, he went to spend three months at a time in Menton, uh, which is on the French Riviera, uh, to rest and write and recuperate. Uh, that's a photo taken almost the exact same time. Here is a modern-day photo in pretty much the same buildings, you know, just obviously in color. So you can see this is, this is a pretty nice place to be uh, three months out of the year. And in one sense, it's hard for us to conceive how he could possibly leave a very sick wife for three months to go to the French Riviera. So it's another one of these things we have to, to keep in mind in the historical context. Very, very different scenarios, right? I mean, I personally would never, ever do that uh, nowadays. But also understand that because they uh, began to grow sort of middle class, maybe upper middle class uh, income family, and not uncommon to have two, three, four servants, household servants in those days, if you could afford it. So she had those servants and would uh, help, you know, with household chores and cooking and so forth. Uh, nevertheless, nevertheless, uh, very difficult for her. And again, she was just too sick. She was too sick to travel. Uh, but when she was 
uh, healthy before she got sick, she said this, I was permitted to encircle with him all the comforting care and tender affection which it was in a wife's power to bestow. I deemed it my joy and privilege to be ever at his side, accompanying him on many of his preaching journeys, nursing him in his occasional illnesses, his delighted companion during his holiday trips, always watching over and tending him with the enthusiasm and sympathy with which my great love for him inspired. So that's the life they would have had had it not been for her illness. Secondly, a deep abiding with Christ. And that's probably comes no surprise to you at, at the level of suffering that she had, that she also had developed rich spiritual habits, not only to feed her own soul, but also the soul of her family, specifically the twin boys. Susie's Bible reading habits were to read an average of three chapters every day for her entire life. But her most powerful spiritual experiences came about by a long meditation on a few verses at a time. Years later, she said, None could have more needed the quickening and awakening which I received from the earnest pleadings and mournings of that voice, the voice of the Lord, soon to be the sweetest in all the world to me. So she would read broadly, right, three chapters a day, but then just, just soak and meditate in a, in a few verses. And I, I've said this before, but for me, memorizing Scripture is my pathway to meditating on Scripture. Now, you don't have to memorize Scripture to uh, meditate on it, but if you memorize Scripture, you will, just by its very nature, you'll meditate. That's what, that's what you do. You review the Scripture, you meditate on it, and it, it just gets into your heart and soul. And I just finished memorizing Revelation chapter 1 because that is uh, coming up soon. And just that one chapter and, and, and the way the book of Revelation launches and my time spent reviewing it and reviewing it is already bearing fruit in in my life. I'm not going to memorize all of it, uh, but maybe another chapter or two. Susie's life message was, uh, as I saw in the title page, look to Jesus. And this message she offered to non-Christians and, and Christians, she would say to any Christian grieving over or fighting against and, and hating their sin or suffering through physical or emotional help, uh, uh, pain, she would always say, look to Christ, look to Christ for your help. Her son, Thomas, who followed in his father's footsteps and eventually became the pastor of Metropolitan Tabernacle, um, something he didn't want to do at first. He was in, in New Zealand, and they wanted him to come, and he, he didn't want to, and then finally uh, he, he did, uh, and I think he passed there about 14 years. But he, he says this, I trace my early conversion directly to her earnest pleading and bright example. She denied herself the pleasure of attending Sunday evening services that she might minister the word of life to her household. And I think he's saying she skipped those. That, that's before uh, she began to get ill. And he goes on to say, I like to tell how she bade us sing. Here's what she wanted to sing. There is a fountain filled with blood. Same, same songs. And how when she came to the chorus, she used to say, Dear boys of mine, I have no reason to suppose that you are yet trusting Christ. You will, I hope, an answer to our constant prayers. But till you definitely do, you must not sing. I do believe that Jesus died for me. It is just as wrong to sing a lie as to tell one. Isn't that interesting? Now, that's not the way I would parent today. You know, I, I think there's, there's great benefit in having young children sing songs uh, and learn truths by singing songs. Elizabeth Elliot says uh, she learned almost all of her theology by singing songs in, in her house for, with, with, her, with her parents. Um, but, uh, and of course, she's also recognizing my kids aren't saved yet, which is the way parents have to raise their kids. Uh, these, the, you've got, when they're little, you've got a household of unbelievers, don't, don't you? But that's why you disciple them. That's why you have these family devotions. Um, it's a chief reason. He goes on to say, so they're not allowed to sing, right? I, I can't sing that portion of the hymns. He says, I remember well the bright morning when we came to the breakfast table. I climbed upon her seat and put my arms around my dear mother's neck. I like to have them there still. And I said to her, dear mother, I really think that I do love Jesus. Thank God she took me at my word and said to me, I am so glad to hear it. I believe you do. Then I wanted sunny night to come that I might be able to sing my loudest in the chorus. 
right? Finally, he gets to sing the song that his mom wouldn't let him sing. As Puritan Matthew Henry said, they who pray in the family do well. They who read and pray do better. But they who sing and read and pray do best of all. So I would encourage you, that's, that is a regret that I have as a father. We had pretty regular family devotions uh, uh, when my kids were, were younger, but we pretty much never sang. And, and honestly, to this day, I, I'm not sure why, uh, but, but I, I regret it, and I commend singing to you uh, younger or older families. You know, go to YouTube, Spotify, grab, grab uh, your, your favorite worship songs, uh, uh, a hymn, whatever it is, but, but make singing a part, some part at least, of your family devotions. Charles recalled of of Susie, there's the twin boys, although so weak and ailing and confined to her bedroom for such long periods of time, Mrs. Spurgeon was a faithful trainer of her twin sons in the Christian doctrine, and she had the joy of seeing them both brought to Christ at an early age. So all of her efforts bore wonderful fruit. Thirdly, she had a lifelong ministry to poor pastors. Susie's life changed on the day that Charles handed her the volume of his newest book, Lecture to My Students, and she uh, loved the book so much that that she wished every pastor in England could have a copy, not only have a copy, but have a copy free of charge. Charles looked at his wife and said, well, Susie, will you make it happen? Challenged her. The book fund began in 1875 when Susie invested, you know, Uh, a few shillings of her own to purchase the first 100 books to give away. She inaugurated the book ministry, which over the next 28 years distributed 200,000 books free of charge to needy pastors who were barely, uh, uh, had uh, their libraries were essentially bare. And and she would make sure, she would would vet them. She would make sure they were, I mean, these guys were really poor. Most of them probably had no other books, you know, other than uh, the Bible. And she would send seven or eight books to each pastor, which means she corresponded with almost 30,000 pastors, which is about three pastors every single day for 28 years, and, and, and uh, corresponding, writing letters, and keeping, uh, sending all the books out, keeping detailed records of all of it. She said this, I have received during the 28 days of this month, February, 657 letters, which would work out to not her average of three per day, but 23 per day during that period. She said the figures are easily written, more easily read, but they give faint notion of the amount of labor involved in the correspondence they represent. Here's one of her letters dated July 25th, 1878. Dear Sir, Uh, As soon as you are a settled pastor, it will give me, should the Lord spare my life, the greatest pleasure to respond to your request. Till then, I can do no no more for you than send the two books which accompany this letter. My book fund was established only for the aid and comfort of poor pastors. And much as I feel for and sorrow over the needs of other workers for God, I must keep to the prescribed limits in in order to do my work efficiently and completely. Very truly yours, Susie Spurgeon. Reading between the lines, you're not poor enough. Uh, you only get two books, not the seven or eight books. And understand, what's happening here, yes, she's got a burden for these poor pastors, but who is she ultimately burdened for? Their congregation, right? So a poor pastor gets seven or eight books, you know, on this empty uh, shelf. Uh, he's encouraged and, and able now to, to, to pour uh, more, more uh, uh, greatly into the lives of his people. So she was multiplying her work uh, dozens and hundreds of times over. Susie felt deep pity in her heart, uh, quoting, for those poor bookless ministers who sit sighing for thoughts in the faces of their unfurnished shelves. She longed to lay at their, their door also the provision which is so stimulating and needful, so important to the minister, so refreshing to the people. And books were important to the Spurgeon family, of course, uh, all, all of Spurgeon's sermons were collected. You can still read any of them, listen to them today. He had about 12,000 volumes in his personal library. On average, uh, what, I, what I found, he read six books every, what would you guess? Every week. Six books every week. How did he do that? No social media, <laughs> number one. Other reasons, uh, but he's obviously a, a brilliant man. 
Uh, Charles believed that the book ministry, uh, quoting, supplied my dear suffering companion with a happy work which has opened channels of consolation for her, imported great interest to the otherwise monotonous life of an invalid. Think about that. He said of her, the monotonous life of an invalid, which doesn't sound very complimentary, uh, but he did mean it so. He, he meant this is benefiting her. It's not only benefiting the pastors and, and all those in their congregations, but, but what Susie was doing through this was turning her sorrow into service. Do you see that? Turning all of her great pain into fruitfulness. Number four, faithfulness through the most severe criticism, even hatred. Uh, unlike many celebrity pastors today, and again, you can put a lot of people in that group, and, and some are very solid, some are less so, but Charles refused to ever compromise on the gospel message. He was famous, but he was absolutely willing, and did, in fact, almost let all that go if it meant harming the gospel in any way. Susie walked with her husband through uh, what's arguably the most difficult part of their married lives, what became known as the downgrade controversy, and downgrade meant that the gospel was being downgrade. It was an attack of liberal theology uh, from within the church. So it's one thing to have attacks from outside the church, uh, but, but there were uh, liberal theologians, liberal pastors from within the church that were threatening to destroy the church from, from the inside out. And Spurgeon could not stand by and watch it happen. And because he was Charles Spurgeon, he became the leading voice in that controversy. There were, there were nine key uh, correspondences that were written during uh, uh, the next year, and he wrote seven of the nine. And I'll give you just a couple of quotes from that. He says, A chasm is opening between the men who believe their Bibles and the men who are prepared for an advance upon Scripture. Inspiration and speculation cannot long abide in peace. Compromise, there can be none. We cannot hold the inspiration of the Word and yet reject it. We cannot believe in the atonement and deny it. We cannot hold the doctrine of the fall and yet talk of the evolution of spiritual life from human nature. We cannot recognize the punishment of the impenitent and yet in indulge the larger hope, which means, you know, some will just say, well, yes, they're lost, but you know, you never know, God just might somehow uh, save them without Jesus. One way or the other, we must go. Decision is the virtue of the hour. Neither when we have chosen our way can we keep company with those who go the other way. So you start to, to, to see the seeds here. He is not going to remain with this group of churches. He wrote, Avowed atheists are not a tenth as dangerous as those preachers who scatter doubt and stab at faith. Germany was made unbelieving by her preachers, and England is following in her track. And of course, throughout history, uh, we're also following as a country. He said, these men deepened their own condemnation and promoted the everlasting ruin of many of their followers by their hypocrisy and deceit, professing to be the ambassadors of Christ and the heralds of his glorious gospel. Their aim was to ignore his claims, deny him his rights, lower his character, rend the glorious vesture of his salvation, and trample his crown in the dust. How quickly sound doctrine turns in to false teaching, how quickly it can be lost. Which is why I've said it publicly, and the elders have, have agreed multiple times over the years, as much as we appreciate our denomination and, and the free church and what it has been and what it currently is, if they were to go astray, we are gone in an instant. We would not remain in a denomination that would deny sound doctrine. And that's what he did. He eventually left. He resigned from the Baptist Union. And understand, the immensity of that decision, by, by all uh, reason, Spurgeon was the Baptist Union, you see? He, he was sort of holding it up because of his popularity. And uh, he resigned from that. And the most popular preacher in the land suddenly had an army of enemies. And he lost large sums of financial support, endured endless criticism in the press, endless criticism on the streets of London. Susie believed that this fight for the gospel purity, which uh, started in the last five years of Charles' life, uh, led him to an early grave at age 57, quoting her. His fight for the faith had cost him his life. 
Yet he never regretted a step he had taken. For throughout the whole affair, he felt such a divine compulsion as Luther realized when he said, I can do no other. Number five, she was engaged in full-time ministry until the day of her death. The last three months of Charles' life, which turned out to be the last three months of his life, he was again going to the French Riviera, but she experienced such a miraculous alleviation of symptoms. She was able to go with him for the very first time, one and only time there, and they spent three months at the Hotel Beau Rivage, where Charles died in January three months later. And she wrote, Never shall I cease to bless God for his tender mercy in permitting me to be with my beloved and to minister to his happiness and comfort during those blessed three months. She says, I can bear my testimony to the fact that his last conscious moments were embittered by grief over those who had departed from the faith. The Baptist Union and our own men who had turned aside from the truth, was specially mentioned, and our dear sufferer was only comforted by the knowledge that he had done all he could to bring about a better state of things. So what does that tell us? That's a, that's a, a window into his heart, that he was not just a, a, a fiery man uh, that's going to defend sound doctrine at the cost of people. No. He cared so much about these lost preachers, these lost men, that his dying days, his Last days, they were painfully on his heart. He, he did die then in January. Unfortunately, Susie now is so weak. They're a 1,000 miles from London. They, they uh, take his body. She's got helpers. They, they take his body back to London. She is not able to attend her own husband's funeral. Not long after uh, Charles died, Susie moved about 70 miles south to a, a, a town by the sea called Bexhill. And um, she soon discovered that, uh, sorry, Brexil, I said that wrong, didn't I, Masons? Brexil. Um, she soon discovered that there's no Baptist churches here. Even though, you know, the Baptist Union was, was uh, ended up not being a, a good place for them. And by the way, they left the Baptist Union. They, they did not want to start their own denomination. They just didn't want to be a part of something that was not pure. So no Baptist there, uh, and the Lord soon led her to start a Baptist church to establish one herself. She sought out a pastor that she knew, and of course, she still is very popular herself, so she's got a lot of friends, and she, she was able to have some people move to the area. She uh, had people donate to the cause, and they were able to uh, get funds for their first building. So, so think about it. In her late 60s, she planted a church. Invalid, suffering pain, Late 60s, planted a church. Who says you're supposed to retire? Who says that? The world says that. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that every believer is in full-time ministry every day of their lives, Lord willing, up until their dying breath. During this time, her son Thomas, who again did eventually become the pastor of Metropolitan Tabernacle, but shortly after he took over, the church burned down, 1898. So Susie goes back to London, and because of her popularity, they, they established a, a fundraising time where she's going to be there two hours only because she's too weak to be there any longer than that. While she sat there for two hours, uh, people brought literally to her feet 6,300 pounds, which in today's dollar would be $870,000 to help rebuild the church. One of the last days of her life, Susie summoned Thomas, again, one of her sons, to her bedside. And Thomas said that the parting benediction from her dear lips would echo in my grateful heart till I also hear the master's call. At half past eight on the morning of Thursday, October 22nd, 1903, my mother was not, for God took her. There had been much suffering during the last illness, but the end itself was peace. Such was the passing of a truly remarkable woman, good, gifted, gracious, and encourager of many, especially of the struggling servants of the king. And given all that we've seen so far, it should be no surprise that she had a continuing generations of a Christian legacy. You look back, both her and Charles' uh, history, they have uh, generations of believers, and generations of believers have followed ever since. And I was able to locate two great, great grandchildren of Charles and 
Susie Spurgeon. And the first one is, you've got the author and his wife, and on the, on the, the far left is Susie Spurgeon Cochran, named after Susie Spurgeon, who actually wrote the afterword of this book, and she writes this. Our God is such a generous and giving God because he answered this prayer so far. My grandfather Harold, which was Thomas's son, lived for the glory of Jesus. My dad, David, also followed him, and God has opened my brothers Richard and my eyes to the glory of Christ and given us a desire for him. I intend to bring my children up in the faith, and by God's grace, this prayer will continue to be answered for generations to come to the glory of God. And I've said, I think many times over the years, that one of the prayers of my life is to live long enough to see Christian grandchildren, right? To, to know that they're, they're, they're truly saved. I also found this guy, Elton Spurgeon, great, great grandson of Susie and Charles. He was not a pastor. In fact, he spent his whole life as a toolmaker, retired as a toolmaker, then became a pastor, then went to seminary so he could be a better pastor. So who says you're supposed to retire? So Susie Spurgeon, faithful in her suffering and pain and loneliness, turning all that sorrow into deep, glorious service, abiding in Christ and beckoning everyone she would ever meet. Look to Christ. Look to Jesus. And that's what we get to do now as we move into a time of the Lord's Supper. We look to Jesus. And in so doing, we, we ourselves are, we are spiritually united with Charles and Susie Spurgeon, are we not? We are spiritually united with the persecuted church. The persecuted church whose who's suffering makes Susie Spurgeon's suffering look like nothing. And we're united with, with one another in, in this room and, and with those at, at the first service. And, and that Christian unity, yes, invisible at times, but is so, so valuable, so important that the Lord says, if you hold unrepentant sin and you, you're not able to confess it or deal with it or apologize, uh, reconcile with somebody uh, in the moment, uh, you, you must not partake of this. That's how he holds up that unity in Christ. But if you do know the Lord as your Savior, uh, we would uh, welcome you, encourage you, welcome you to join with us. We'd ask that you would come down the center aisle, take the elements, have a seat, and then we'll partake together.
Susie and Charles Spurgeon aren't taking communion anymore, are they? They are in communion with the Lord Jesus, awaiting a much greater feast one day, the marriage supper of the Lamb, of which we all await. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread. And after he broke it, he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me. Would you please stand for a final prayer? Father, thank you for our identity in your Son, identity in Christ, and our, our unity in Christ. May we not take that for granted. May we make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. May we be encouraged and motivated by men and women like Susie and Charles Spurgeon. In Jesus' name, amen.